Hi, and good afternoon. I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here with us at, the, at this live session from Masa University, Saujana Putra Campus. My name is Murni Amira Binti Muhammad Aminuddin. I am lecturer from Faculty of Health Sciences, Masa University, and I will be moderating today's session. Today's webinar is quite interesting as well as important for us. Today, we're going to talk about obesity time for action. And this webinar is proudly organized by the Faculty of Health Sciences, Masa University. Dear viewers, before we proceed further, I would like to give you just a little bit briefing and overview of the program offered by the Faculty of Health Sciences, Masa University. For your information, under Faculty of Health Sciences, we have three departments, which is School of Physiotherapy, Department of Environmental Health, and Department of Medical Imaging. And under each of these departments, we have different programs being offered. For example, under School of Physiotherapy, we have Diploma in Physiotherapy, Bachelor of Physiotherapy, Bachelor of Physiotherapy, Open and Distance Learning, and Master of Physiotherapy. Under Department of Environmental Health, we have Diploma in Environmental Health, Bachelor of Environmental Health and Safety, Bachelor of Environmental Health and Safety, Open and Distance Learning, and Diploma in Occupational Safety and Health. And under Department of Medical Imaging, we have Diploma in Medical Imaging Radiography, Bachelor of Medical Imaging and uh, sorry, Bachelor of Medical Imaging Open and Distance Learning. So why join Health Sciences? Uh, basically, Health Sciences offer high job demand in which uh, most of the graduate working in essential services is a no boring work routine. Uh, you have variety of uh, activities can be conducted. You have lucrative remuneration low risk of job redundancy, and you cannot be uh, replaced by robot and or machineries, and you have opportunity to work in variety of settings, whether it's private, whether it's government sector, and it's basically a career you can feel good about because it, most of the time it involves helping people. So this is Master of Physiotherapy, which is one-year program uh, in case you join as a full-time and two-year program for part-time mode, and this is the entry requirement for Master of Physiotherapy. Next, we're going to proceed with Bachelor of Physiotherapy, Bachelor of Physiotherapy Open and Distance Learning, Bachelor of Environmental Health and Safety, Bachelor of Environmental Health and Safety Open and Distance Learning, Bachelor of Medical Imaging, and Bachelor of Medical Imaging Open and Distance Learning. And this is the entry requirement for those potential students. And for those who are entering with diploma, you are eligible for credit transfer. However, it's subjected to approval from the faculty and also from the university. Next, we have diploma in physiotherapy, diploma in environmental health, and diploma in medical imaging. And this is the entry requirement for those programs. And lastly, Diploma in Occupational Safety and Health, which is a three years program. And this is the entry requirement for Diploma in Occupational Safety and Health. And Infinite Excellence is what MASA aspire to provide to each of its graduate. So why you should choose Faculty of Health Sciences, MASA University? In terms of teaching and learning, we offer experienced and dedicated international pool of academic staff. You can uh, choose to, uh, to study various study modes like conventional or open and distance learning, sorry. Then cross-teaching by expert. MASA has the most number of health uh, discipline in a single IPTA, uh, sorry, IPTS. Interactive teaching and emphasis on hands-on clinical and practical skill through face-to-face -face or online platform using LMS. We have a wide list of hospital and institution for clinical and industrial placement. And also the most important thing is accredited by MQA and JPA with some of the program like physiotherapy are being recognized uh, with dual award with ARU. For financial aid, MASA also offer various scholarship. Uh, for example, Haji Abdullah Academy Excellence Scholarship, Foundation Scholarship, Blue Ribbon Scholarship, School Teachers Scholarship, Family Scholarship, and Single Parent Scholarship. The program offered in uh, Faculty of Health Sciences, Masa University also have a lot of collaboration and affiliation with local and international uh, agencies and also university. 
And all programs involved in the Faculty of Health Sciences will offer student mobility program with uh, international university. Previously, we have conducted several uh, student mobility program with Erio Sose University, lovely professional university, and we have Universitas Sri Wijaya, Indonesia. And we welcome you to join us at any time you want. Okay, please contact us through MASA website or through our face, uh, Facebook page to know more about our program or simply leave a comment. We will get back to you. Your question concerning this webinar session can be listed in the chat box. Before we begin, let me tell you a little bit on today's topic. So obesity can be defined as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that present a risk to health. It is a widespread and expensive chronic condition that affect both adults and children as, and it also currently on top 10 healthcare agenda in, of many country. It affects general health and well-being, medical and healthcare causes, costing, and also productivity and also late, uh, of late, basically currently, we talk about mental health readiness related to obesity as well. Thus, it requires step and action to be taken to prevent and control obesity among the population. We have here with us our speaker for today's, which is Mr. Rajan. Hi, Hi Mr. Rajan. Hello. Mr. Rajan is a lecturer from Department of Environmental Health, Faculty of Health Sciences, Massa University. Mr. Rajan holds a master's degree in environmental study, a bachelor's degree in health science, and a diploma from Public Health Inspector from Royal Society for Public Health, London. He served the Ministry of Health Malaysia as Senior Environmental Health Officer for 18 years before pursuing a career as an academician for the last 15 years. Let's give the floor to Mr. Rajan to start with today's webinar. Thank you, Ms. Moderator, and a very good afternoon to everyone. Today, we're going to talk about obesity, and the time for action is now. So today's uh, talk will uh, basically touch on some introduction on what is obesity, a little bit of discussion on obesity, and some recommendations for us to follow through for the prevention of obesity. Decades ago, our primary concern about global nutrition was linked to underweight and undernourished individuals. While this problem continued to persist in many parts of the world, we are also faced with the new health concern. It is about the rapid rise in obesity. In response to this growing burden, the World Health Organization has set a target to stop the rise in obesity by 2025, which is three years from now. And uh, to date, there is no country that has been successful in reversing the rise in obesity. Thus, the issue of obesity is nothing new. And it has been a major global public health concern for many years now. And it is understandable as obesity increases the risk of contracting various chronic diseases. And it also puts a strain on the finances of governments and individuals in terms of healthcare and medical expenditure. So what is obesity? According to the World Health Organization definition, it is an abnormal or excessive fat accumulation in the body that may impair health. It is commonly measured with body mass index, or the acronym is BMI. Right? Weight in kilogram divided by square of the height in meters. This is a very easy measure to for us to say that we are obese, overweight, and are we within the range? Adults with a BMI of over 25 kilograms per meters, meters is said to be overweight, while those above 30 kilograms per meter are classified as obese. So the worldwide obesity has nearly tripled since 1975. In 2016, more than 1.9 billion adults, 18 years and older, were overweight. Of these, 650 million were said to be obese. 39% of the adults aged 18 years and 
over were overweight in 2016 and 13% were obese in this group. Most of the world's population live in countries where overweight and obesity kills more people than those who are underweight. Hence, we need to solve this problem of obesity. And obesity has a major impact on national economies by reducing the productivity and the life expectancy of their population. And it also increases the disability and the overwhelming healthcare costs of major countries. Many developed and developing countries are facing the same dilemma. This is a figure showing that uh, the share of adults that are obese in 1975 to 2016. From this figure, we can see that the United States, or if we can uh, summarize that, most of the developed countries are facing a lot of issues on obesity. And uh, the economic burden of obesity is staggering. In the US alone, the direct healthcare cost is estimated at 480 billion or 9.2% of the gross domestic product. The indirect cost to productivity is about 1.2 trillion. So that is a huge amount. So what about Malaysia? Obesity in Malaysia accounts for 13.3% of the total health care cost. All right. And it is 0.54% of the GDP as compared to US, we are very much lower. All right. Uh, but in terms of money, it is 1.7 billion US dollars. And this does not include the indirect cost of lost labor productivity due to absenteeism and medical leave. So it is quite high in Malaysia as well. And this is a figure that shows where we Malaysians stand among the countries, especially the Southeast Asian countries. So among the Southeast Asian countries, we are the leaders in obesity. We are high in the rank, just after Australia, right? And uh, if you look at the income barrier, those who are in the high income and the upper middle income groups, are having a lot of issues on obesity as compared to the lower income groups. So the middle income and the high income groups are the most affected in Malaysia. If you look at obesity in Malaysia, the prevalence of obesity in Malaysia has been rising since 2006 from 14% right up to 19.7% in 2019. And majority of the groups uh, especially those who are under the age of 18 years old, uh, the first graph shows that there is a sharp rise in children, uh, those who are under 18 years and below. So there is a sharp rise in Malaysia in uh, those groups. So obesity is a major risk factor for heart and other non-communicable diseases like diabetes, type 2, hypertension, cholesterol, and so forth. And this is alarming. And according to the National Health Mobility Survey done in Malaysia in 2019, out of 50.1% of the adult Malaysian population, 30.4% are overweight. And out of this, 19.7% are obese. So it is an alarming rate. And this is something that we have to look out to. So looking back at the figures from the National Health Mobility Survey, 54.5% uh, of women are found to be obese and 60.9% of them are within the age of 55 and 59. And according to the National Health Mobility Survey in 2019, 29.8% of the children aged 5 to 17 were overweight or obese. So this is alarming, All right? And among the Southeast Asian countries, we Malaysia stands high and tall with 15.6% of obesity prevalence among the neighboring, neighboring countries. And the contributing factors were uh, narrowed down to food intake, physical inactivity, 
some environmental factors, genetics, and as well as uh, other reasons like diseases, stress, and medicine. In February 2020, the World Health Organization stated that obesity has reached epidemic proportions globally, with at least 2.8 million of people dying each year as a result of being overweight or obese. So that is the major concern. So when we talk about obesity, we always talk about the BMI or body mass index, which is widely used as it is an easy and quick measure to use. Very easy to calculate, very easy to identify, very easy to get the figures. And But it does not take into account how much fat is in our body weight. Now that, that's a, a lot of people are asking about this, right? Because uh, the definition by WHO is accumulation of body fats. So by BMI does not take into account how much fat is in our body weight. But a more reliable measure is to measure the exact body fat. For men, for men any body fat that is above 25% and for women, anything that's more than 35% is said to be obese. The gold standard for measuring body fat is by using a scanner. We call that a DEXA scanner. Uh, which is uh, huge and it has to be placed indoors and this and not everyone can purchase one. Uh, it costs about 16 to 25,000 ringgit. Uh, depends on the model type and all that. So definitely we are going for the BMI index as a guide or indicator for measure. So BMI or body fat for obesity. The current measure adopted for body fat, uh, the method used to directly measure body fat are not available in daily practice. So that means the scanner is not available daily. So what we do is we use the BMI index, which everyone can do it. Obesity is calculated by indirect estimation of the body fat. Okay, The standard measure to calculate overweight and obesity is the body mass index. So overweight refers to a weight above the normal range, all right? The normal range is between 18.5 to 24.9. So anything above 25, we say the person is overweight, okay? Uh, this measure also does a poor job of predicting a person's metabolic health, the BMI index. In 2016, uh, researchers compared people's BMI with insulin resistance uh, these are the comorbidities that will be, you know, affecting the obese people. Insulin resistance, markers of inflammation, blood pressure, triglyceride, your cholesterol, and the glucose levels. Nearly half of those classified as overweight and about a quarter of those classified as obese were metabolically healthy by these measures. On the other hand, 31% of these with a normal BMI were found to be metabolically unhealthy. So the circumf there's another measure that we use for uh, body fat or to identify the mass uh, obesity uh, index of a person. The circumference of the waist is another easy measure of obesity. The waist circumference greater than 35 inches in women and a circumference greater than 40 inches in men increases the risk of obesity. People who are obese, okay, according to BMI, greater than 30, and who have larger waist size may need more aggressive weight loss management. So let's look at obesity and fat cells. For an adult, fat cells do not increase and can hold fats up to a certain amount. The excess fat is then stored around organs and muscle tissues. But study shows that 20% of people with BMI, more than 30 who are obese, are found to be healthy. So what type of measure are we going to use now? So this is the graph that shows that uh, if you look at the body fat, which is 25% here, and then the uh, body mass index of 25, 24.9, uh, uh, 25 and above, you can see that 12% in men, 
12% are healthy obese and uh, 6%, 9% are skinny fat. Okay, uh, then the women also same. We find that there are 3% of them who are healthy obese and they are also a group of people who are also skinny fat in women. So how, so which scale to use now? Are we going to use the BMI, body fat, waist circumference, or the weighing machines, or our mirror to see that whether we are obese or not? Okay. So what are the main causes of obesity? So actually, whatever way we pick, or whatever scale that we use, if the body mass index is a very easy measure and it is the most effective currently being used. So for further analysis of your body mass or your fat, body fat and all that, then you have to go for the other methods to say that you are obese or not. What are the main causes? Now let's look at what are the causes of obesity. Malaysians are known for love of food and have access to a variety of cuisines daily. Uh, but diet alone is not the sole contributing factor for obesity. A poor diet accelerates the development of obesity when it is accompanied by a sedentary lifestyle. If your peers or family members are obese, then most likely they are obese too. All right? You are obese too. What are the main causes of obesity? There are main factors, many factors that can contribute to obesity. Among the key factors are excessive food intake, which has high, which are high in fats and sugars, and which exceed the daily requirement, right? Your calorie diet requirement. Lack of exercise and physical activities are also the main causes. And several other related factors such as age, gender, genetics, some diseases, and taking certain medications such as steroids also may cause obesity. Prolonged use of steroids. So what is the actual cause of obesity? So there are a lot of questions regarding this. Uh, basically, we have narrowed down to certain uh, numbers like too much of food, consuming a high calorie diet, uh, daily calorie needs range from uh, 1,600 to 2,400 for, per day for women. And a calorie need for uh, of uh, 2,000 to 3,000 calories for adult men. So if you are within this range, uh, you are said to be uh, preventing obesity. But uh, I'm not so sure about this, right? Okay. And then there is lack of exercise. Physical activity plays an important role in weight reduction process, but it also brings about favorable changes to body composition, decreases risk for disease and improves quality of life. Uh, lack of exercise is a major contributor, but if you look at certain people, uh, they lose fat after doing exercises, but once they stop doing the exercises, they build back muscle. I mean, they build back the fat. They build back and then uh, they keep on, their weight keep on rising. So, and also the wrong food. Studies have found that the risk of obesity is 45% higher among adolescents whose diet is based on ultra-processed foods. Food that are processed, food that are manufactured, sold in supermarkets and some retail outlets. Fast foods are also known to be as uh, ultra processed food. Currently, we have a lot of those foods in the market. Foods that are prepackaged meals, sweetened breakfast, cereals, and reconstituted meat and meat products. Heavily processed foods often include unhealthy levels of added sugar, sodium, and fat. Uh, these ingredients make the food we eat taste better, but in the end, we are also post with it question of being obese and overweight. Numerous epidemiological studies also uh, examine the roles of genetic factors in the development of obesity. Rarely, obesity occurs in families according to a clear inheritance patterns, but uh, currently there are studies showing that there is some connection to it. 
and then our microbiomes in our body. The human body plays a host to trillions of microbes. How gut bacteria affect our and influence our eating habits, our cravings. Okay, the bacteria in our body, in our gut, has also got food preferences. So this uh, makes you crave for sugar, for food. So how are you going to lose weight with this? So in an evaluated study in 2021, 105 individuals found that certain bacteria to be associated with the ability to lose weight and a strong resistance to weight loss also. So this may explain why some people have a harder time losing weight than others. So your gut bacteria plays a role also in obesity or weight gain. Epidemiologically, uh, sleep and obesity, uh, epidemiological studies shows that short sleep duration and poor sleep quality uh, as new risk factors for development of obesity. So sleep is an important modulator of neuroendocrine function, glucose metabolism, insulin sensitivity, concentrations of cortisol, leptin, and increased hunger and appetite. So your sleep matters. Okay. So behavioral sleep reduction is becoming an endemic in the 24-hour society and affects the individual circadian rhythm. Right. So Malaysians are known to work more. Uh, so there is a relation to this. Okay. So you sleep less, you get stressed. And stress and obesity, uh, there is an impact of stress on obesity as well. Stress has long been interrelated to obesity, especially abdominal obesity. Increased long-term cortisol levels, a stress hormone, are strongly related to abdominal obesity. Every time you are stressed, your adrenal glands release adrenaline and cortisol. And as a result, glucose is released into the bloodstream. Sugar cravings happen due to low glucose levels. So, is obesity, next question is, is obesity preventable? So, let's look at some of the uh, action that we can take uh, to prevent uh, obesity. So, what has been suggested by some of the major, uh, in some of the literatures that I've read, exercise regularly three to four times a week or more is required. And we need to avoid high sugar and ultra processed food, the manufactured foods. Okay, the manufactured foods that are sold in our supermarkets. Take control of portion size of food at every meal. So we'll, that means your portion has to be accordingly done. The food portion. So I will look at that in the next slide. You drink enough water per day. Eat when you are hungry and stop before you are full. Avoid taking heavy meals before sleep or late night meals. And then you need to monitor your weight regularly. So you need a weighing machine. All right. The type of weighing machine should be digital weighing machine so that you will not be upset with any increase or decrease in body weight. So digital weighing machine is appropriate as compared to the uh, analog type with the uh, you know, scales, tipping, you know, you, you get a rough idea. But the digital one will show you a correct reading. Okay. So, recommended portion size. So, when we talk about recommended portion size, the Ministry of Health Malaysia has come out with a, a concept of healthy food plate concept, which is a quarter, quarter, half concept. That means you have a plate, quarter of your plate should be grains or green products, Another quarter of your plate should be fish or poultry, meat or eggs. And then half of your plate should be uh, comprised of foods, I mean fruits and vegetables. So this is what the quarter, quarter and half concept is all about. And then uh, regular exercise is have to be, you have to aim to 150 minutes of moderate to intense physical activity per week. Okay, moderate to intense. So, 150, 120, 2 hours per week. 
120 to 150 minutes per week. So three times a day, three times a week should suffice. And remember, obesity is not just about physical appearance, right? So you have to look in the mirror to look at your body. And it is also a condition that could give rise to other non-communicable diseases that we have discussed earlier. Right? So these are the things that uh, we should be looking at to understand more. You should read more on uh, obesity. There are a lot of uh, papers out there, a lot of uh, discussion on obesity. So weight reduction is a great strategy for overweight and obese patients to improve blood sugar, blood pressure, and cholesterol control. Uh, that is killing at least three birds with one stone. So obesity, as we all know, is a global health crisis and we should look forward to, you know, maintain our uh, healthy body weight uh, as uh, a vision by the World Health Organization. And with that, I will end my topic here today. Thank you and uh, back to the moderator, please. These are the references. And there's a World Obesity Day on the 25th of March every year. Thank you. Back to the moderator. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rajan, for insightful and informative presentation. Uh, dear viewers, if you have any question for Mr. Rajan, please leave us a comment. So basically, I think there are a few questions already being asked. <coughs> uh, maybe we can go to the first question that we have today. Okay. So, uh, I think we have one question from Salfarina Samad. She said that, hi, I uh, would like to ask, in your opinion, what is the best solution for childhood obesity? Okay, thank you, Ms. Salfarina Samad. Uh, with regards to childhood obesity, uh, like uh, what we all know, you know, I too am a father. I too have children and all. Uh, uh, our children are, you know, they are more prone to uh, exposed to fast food. You know, even like uh, I have a younger son who is uh, in his uh, teenage years. Uh, he loves to eat fast food, burgers and all that. But we cannot limit them to eat. You know, whenever I say that, uh, please stop eating too much of this, you know, the mother starts to, you know, harp on me and saying that, let him eat. So basically, it all boils down to the family. How are we going to manage this? You know, come back to the family. How are you going to manage uh, overweight and obesity in your family? So you have to talk it out, you know, by stopping, uh, you know, food intake, you know, asking your child to go for regular exercises. Is that going to help? So there is no one solution for this. So we have to look it look at the holistic picture for that, you know, holistic picture for that. If you look uh, at uh, the Malaysian uh, average, one in five are in the obese range, one in every five percent, you know, and uh, three out of ten have got uh, diabetes. Uh, three out of ten, uh, two out of ten has got uh, hypertension. So. It's a lummy. So we have to begin somewhere. The best place to begin is in the house with our family members and of course with our children. So there is no one direction uh, or solution for childhood obesity. So we have to look at it holistically because our children are going to school. We can stop them at home from eating all those junk food and all that. But what about school? What about the peer members, peer, peer group? All right. So there are a lot of factors that are affecting this. All right. Thank you. Okay. We go to the second question from Azalina Suzianti. Uh, she said, hi, Mr. Rajan. What are the factors that contribute to childhood obesity? <laughs> like I said just now. All right. Thank you, uh, Ms. Azalina. Uh, as I said just now, uh, basically, we boil down to the food intake. Of course, we love to see our kids eating a lot of variety of foods. And now with the Malaysian uh, culture of, you know, 
uh, jalan-jalan cari makan, you know, and uh, you know, tasting all the varieties of food. Now, if you go out at the mall or anywhere you go, you can see there are a variety of new foods being churned up, you know, and these foods are made from ultra processed. They are known as ultra processed food, so they are manufactured. Okay, so the best will be like going towards taking, uh, uh, you know, cooking at home. Home food is the best food, All right? Home food is the best food. I think we should teach our children to, you know, to eat more at home. I mean, cook food rather than, uh, you know, going out and all that. Once in a while, it's okay, but not on a regular basis. Every time we go out nowadays, our children definitely will point out to the all the fast foods that are available in the malls so they love or uh, enjoy going there so we have to you know teach our children it's back to us it's back on to us uh to find out what are the best ways to prevent this or to minimize this we, I, i'm sure we cannot totally stop that from taking all this junk food and uh, ultra processed food and all that because the food industry is go, growing every day and the amount of food that has been, uh, you know, produced, the variety of food that has been produced is huge. And currently, like, uh, it's never going to die soon. Everybody needs food. It's a basic need, basic instinct, you know. But the processed food, we have to read the labels. We have to find out what is inside that food. If you buy, like, uh, uh, let's say, a ketchup, uh, tomato ketchup or chili ketchup. Read the label. Look at the first ingredient. When I buy chili ketchup, I am buying chili ketchup. I'm not buying sugar chili ketchup. Read the first ingredient in the label. The first ingredient is always sugar. That means 60% of the food is sugar. So those things, you know, uh, we have to learn about reading labels, the calories that that are found in the in the uh, labels, right? Of course, when you go to the fast food uh, uh, premises, right? Of course, they don't put the labels there, <laughs> you know. So you don't know what's the content, the exact ingredient that is in the food. So it comes back to as as parents, as family members. We should be knowledgeable on this. We have to look it holistically. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now we see the next question from Mr. Irfan Hadi. He said, hello, I would like to ask, is there a difference between processed and unprocessed food in their contribution to the obesity? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Irfan Hadi. Uh, by virtue of the name processed, and unprocessed food. So unprocessed food is raw food. All right. The raw food that uh, my, like me at, at my age, my mother cooked most of the food are unprocessed food. That means raw food. All right. We buy from the fresh market, you know, the wet market, buy fresh food, fresh vegetables. We cook at home. You know, I, I was introduced to like fast food at the age uh, when I was in Form 3. You know, I started taking fast food after Form 3. But what about the youngsters now? You know, even the, even the milk, the, the, the powdered milk is processed food. So processed food means food that is manufactured and then it they add additives inside. Additives like food preservatives, coloring, you know, taste, flavor, and everything inside that food. And then it is sold to the public in cans, in packages, you know, it's sold in the in the in the uh, supermarkets or retail outlets, food retail outlets. But uh, in the Ministry of Health, we have the food unit at every district level. So they are the ones who are responsible in going and taking samples of this food. And then uh, they analyze this food so that they follow the food regulations 1985. Uh, the, even up to the content of the food itself. 
So whatever ingredients that is inside the food, which are you know allowable by the food regulations, are in. So the additives are there. This is what processed food are: additives, and then you know the content of the food is uh, you know there is added value to that. It's not just like uh, if you look at sardines, a can of sardines, right? A can of sardine, dalam tin, a can of sardine. So they process that sardine in a factory. You know, they put the tomatoes, additives, so that they can last for at least two years on the shelf. All right? So they have coloring, flavoring, agents inside and whatnot. As compared to the fresh fish you go and buy at the fresh uh, wet market. All right? You take back, you skin it, and then you put, uh, uh, you know, the, some other ingredients like... Uh, uh, spices and all whatnot, and then you fry and then you eat. It's direct. It's raw. Okay, the one that is processed, like ultra processed food, they add a lot of sugars inside. So that's the main difference between uh, processed and unprocessed food. Okay, thank you, Mr. Raja. And we have another question from Intan. Intan. Uh, she said, hi, sir, is there initiative from government to control obesity among the populations? Okay, thank you, uh, Intan. Lentan Intan. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Of course, definitely there are many initiatives undertaken by the government, especially the Ministry of Health, to control obesity among population. Uh, one I would like to add is the one uh, aerobics. Uh, carried out on a weekly basis, on a community basis, you know, aerobics. Even in the office, uh, office uh, they are, have introduced aerobics uh, dancers and, you know, exercises. And then they are also promoting, uh, like, uh, uh, activities like uh, uh, runs and all that, you know, uh, like a half marathon, running, cycle, cycle -ton, Walkathon, you know, all these are all uh, government-led uh, activities that we should take part. And most of these activities are community-based. That means they can localize at the community level. You can approach your uh, district health office, nearby health, district health office, if you want to conduct uh, mm -hmm. some activities in your area. It can be a gotoroyong type, no, no harm. Gotoroyong is also a form of... Uh, a healthy activity. You sweat when you do that gotoroyong, cleaning up. Okay? In another way, it also helps to reduce the breeding of mosquitoes in your area. So that is another approach. That's a good approach. Okay? And then uh, you can do it as a community. That will be much more better, uh, much more livelier. Like uh, in universities, they can conduct uh, uh, games, right? Uh, Inter-faculty games, you know, like football. Football is a very good game. Like you see the, the the recent World Cup. Look at the numbers of people that are, you know, watching that. You know, they're getting happy, getting sad, you know, <laughs> when their team loses and all those things. So all a uh, form of exercise that can help uh, not to control, but to prevent obesity. Prevent. We can only prevent. We cannot control that. Very difficult, very difficult because there are a lot of factors outside there, internal factors as well as external factors that affect the obesity among population. So that's why I say we have to look at it as uh, holistically uh, towards this problem because until now, there is no one country has reduced the number of obesity in their country, not even one yet. So it's up to us now to work out how we are going to go about this. All right? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Okay. I think that's all the question that we got for today because we also running out of time. So we have come to the end of today's session. Thank you, Mr. Rajan, for joining us today and providing such interesting topic. To our wonderful audience, thank you for joining us at this webinar. We look forward to your comments and participation at the future event hosted by Masa University. In case of any further queries, you can contact us through Masa website, 
or visit our social media. That's it, everyone. Have a nice day. Take care. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Stay safe.